Uh, welcome everyone to the welcome everyone to the first uh, evening of Almost Heaven Star Party 2019. Our speaker this evening is Richard Wright from Software Bisc. He is the imaging. Uh, what's the title you give yourself? Advocate. Evangelist. Evangelist for Software Bisc and a software engineer uh, working on their. Uh, integration of multiple, of multiple smart devices into astrophotography. Uh, he's also a blogger on Sky and Telescope, and he's written a book and maintains his own website, Evening Show? EveningShow.com. So you can find out information about him on EveningShow.com. Please welcome Richard Wright. Thanks. I do like to mention, too, I'm uh, active in the Central Florida Astronomical Society, so I'm not just a stuffed vendor shirt. Uh, I'm also an I was an amateur astronomer before I got into, uh, before I was hired at Software Bisque, and I, I became an imager, and I found a job where I get to image and help develop imaging products, so it works out, works out really well for me. So astrophotography's come a long way in just a few uh, years. <clears throat> I was uh, helping at a science fair and a friend of mine uh, works at this uh, radio observatory and museum in uh, western North Carolina. And they had this glass plate here with this little little galaxy pair on it. And I said, that's cool. I, you know what? I should shoot that. This was taken in, in March of, of 1977. This was taken uh, just a few years ago in Okeechobee, Florida with a Celestron 9 and a quarter and a CCD camera. This picture took tens of millions of dollars to take. This picture took thousands of dollars, not even tens of thousands of dollars to take. This picture was taken when Star Wars was in movie theaters. This is how far we've come since Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker uh, first entered our popular culture, and that's that's quite quite a long ways. But we don't we don't do this. There are some purists or some people in far corners of the world who still use film or still use glass plates. But most of us use digital cameras and computers uh, to do our astrophotography. And it's it's getting a little bit out of hand. It's uh, it's like herding cats. We you've got. You got a camera control, mount control, you got to get on target, you got to get focused, you had a guider, auto focusing, uh, controlling your dew heaters. Dew heaters are sophisticated. They've got temperature probes and, and they've got atmospheric probes and they know what the dew point is and they're watching how, co how, how, how close your lens is getting to the dew point to whether it should add some, some heat down here. So you can't image today without a computer. Now, there's probably somebody in the audience who's like my son, a smart aleck, and you're going to go, yeah, I use a DSLR buster. I don't need a computer. Joke's on you. There is a computer inside your DSLR. And what's happening is the rest of the astronomy industry is going to catch up with DSLRs. And so that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. So in the beginning, you know, computers would fill this whole room to do something like accounting or payroll or something very small. Unless you were a Bond villain, you did not have your own personal computer uh, in your garage. There's probably one weird guy somewhere who did, but we, we won't get into that. Those are is probably sealed by the FBI or something. But in general, people didn't have personal computers. Then personal computers became a thing. People had computers on their, in, on their desk at office. They had their computers in their den at home. Astronomy software for amateurs was born. And this is not the first personal computer. Don't, don't give me too hard, a hard, but it is sort of a nice icon of the birth of the personal computer uh, age. And computers e evolved. Uh, they evolved into beige boxes on their side instead of on the down. Com monitor technology sort of evolved much faster. We still had these big boxes with fans on it and lots of, uh, lots of horsepower. But, you know, today's modern desktop is mostly monitor. I mean, look at the And, yeah, there's an Apple logo there, but HP and other people are doing the same thing. You got a nice, big, beautiful display. And somewhere in, like, this much metal in the back is the computer and all the storage and all the memory and everything that runs that computer. And it's a bazillion times faster. That's a technical term. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's a bazillion times fa better than the computers that sent us to the moon. So, okay, that's pretty cool. 
there's always this guy, though, who's going to try to put this under his mount, you know, to run all of his gears. And I did, this is a friend on Facebook, and I even asked permission. I said, can I use your picture? I didn't tell him I was going to mock him, but I did say, can I use a picture uh, of that? Uh, but, you know, this is sort of the standard imaging computer today. All right, you got a laptop, you got Windows on it, or Macintosh, and, and you're going to plug it in, and you've got the Sky X, of course, or you got Sequence Generator Pro and Maxim, and you got all these programs. But you've got a laptop that you got to take outside and put next to your computer. So a common misunderstanding, though, is I need a... Oh, Richard, Scott, your, pro, your software is really powerful. It's really sophisticated. How much computer do I need to run your software? You do not need a big, powerful computer, all right? Now, if you're going to do PixInsight and image processing and make videos and play computer games, it's another question. But let me kind of let me kind of break it down. Here's what a computer does. Take a picture. Oh, is your picture ready? Okay. Is your picture? Okay. Can I have your picture? Okay, thank you. Take another picture. Computers don't, it, it does not take a lot of CPU power. I'm sorry for that long drawn out example, but it does not take a lot of CPU power to run a mount or to take a picture. Ooh, I'm auto guiding. It doesn't matter. Auto guiding. What's your, what's your auto guider? You're getting one picture every couple of seconds. It's still nothing to a computer. You saw the movie Tron, right? He gets in there, a whole movie goes by, he pops out, three seconds have gone by. All right. For a computer, downloading a guider image and figuring out where the star is and bumping your mount is, again, you don't need a Cray. You don't need liquid nitrogen cooled graphics cards to do all of that stuff. It's a very, very simple, uh, very simple thing, really, that you need to do. So <coughs> the tablet comes along. This is the this is the pinnacle of computing today. Right. A whole computer on a little tablet. All right, you, whether you're iOS or Android or uh, Microsoft has a tablet with Windows embedded in it, this is sort of like, okay, this is where we are today, the, from the room full of computer to a tablet. And everybody's like, hey, I want to use my tablet to image. Well, I, don't, I have a video. I don't know. I forgot. We exported it to PowerPoint. Let's see if the video plays. This is in 2010. So almost 10 years ago, we were looking at how are we going to make a tablet how are we going to use a tablet to control an imaging system? And the answer is you can't. So there here's, here's the Sky X. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay, well, let me just tell you what just, I'm saying. It's like, super for concept. We're here's the thing. You've got this. this right all I'm saying is 10 years ago, we were looking at this. How can we image with the tablet? Right, and you can't not. because I don't how think do you... A great I'm just going to skip over this part. Here's some challenges to imaging with a tablet. All right, how are you going to connect to the devices? Wi-Fi. Right? No, Bluetooth, yeah. <coughs> no. Bluetooth, too slow. Uh, how are you going to connect to the devices? Uh, Wi-Fi, you've got to maintain a connection. Well, sorry. You've got to maintain a connection to the device the entire night, which means you can't, close the, you can't close the tablet. If you minimize it and you go to watch Netflix while you're imaging and it runs low on memory, it's just going to terminate your app in the background. Even for Android, you get the same problem. The iOS is not the only one. They don't multitask uh, very well. So you've got to have this constant connection to it. That's the wrong button. Where are you going to store the images? Well, in 10 years' time, hardly anything has changed. This is the one thing that has changed. My latest tablet you know, has got quite a bit. You could store quite a few images on the tablet. But they don't multitask very well. You can't keep them powered all night. Your tablet will run dead uh, if you keep it going all night. Wireless is not very stable. In 10 years' time, we've not made that much progress in wireless technology. It's a little bit faster. But if you don't believe me, try to run everything wireless at the Texas Star Party on the field with 732.6 other Wi-Fi hotspots that, uh, that are all trying to run their telescopes uh, at the same time. Remote desktop. Ah, this is what I was talking about in the video. It said instead of trying to run everything with the tablet, run it on the computer, on the on the uh, have your laptop at the computer, and then connect to it with the tablet. And now your tablet, you can walk around, you get everything going, and you've got a computer at the mount running everything. The thing is, though, remote desktop with a laptop is the user interface on the tablet is kind of clunky. But that's a very fixable problem. In 10 years' time, somebody's probably said, well, what if we made the user interface more tablet-friendly, but you still ran it on a regular computer? And if you know what I've been working on for the last few years, that's what I've been doing. But I'm not the only one. Other people in the industry have as well. There's actually another talk tomorrow morning I'm looking forward to. Um, 
And of course, it doesn't solve the power issues because you have to keep it, uh, you have to keep it going, even if your laptop is there. Um, or does it? Oh, I skipped over a slide. Surely I slipped over a slide. No, it's coming up. Believe it or not, I did rehearse this. All right. I'm a, little, I'm a little out of sorts. Forgive me. It's been a long drive. There's a hurricane about to blow my house down. <laughs> there. Sympathy card. It always works. All right. So when I first started doing what we're talking about, I wanted to go somewhere and go battery. So like here at the Almost Seven Star Party, there's no power in the field. If you want to image all night, what are you going to do? You got to bring a lot of batteries. I could keep a, a mount alive on a battery. I can keep a cooled CCD camera alive on a battery. I can't keep a laptop alive all night long on a battery unless I have a wheelbarrow full of batteries. They don't like it. And I even had spare batteries for my laptop and what you got to shut the laptop down while you swap batteries. So it's a bit of a problem. So let's kind of step back and look at portable imaging. This was sort of the state of the art in portable imaging, right? You get one of these little sky trackers and you put your DSLR on it and you can, it'll fit in your suitcase. The TSA doesn't get too freaked out because you're carrying this uh, on the airplane. Or maybe you want to get really ambitious <coughs> and you put a telescope on there. It's still kind of a small telescope and it's still pretty limited as to the types of deep sky photography you want to do. And if you want to do nightscapes, that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with nightscapes. I'm doing nightscapes tonight. I love nightscapes. But really, you want this is what you want. You want to do, if you want to go somewhere dark with no power, because let's face it, places that have a lot of power usually have a lot of light. So if you want to go somewhere where it's dark, you got to go somewhere where there's not a lot of power. And you want to take nice deep space images uh, that go deep. And you really need a dark sky for that. So this is what we want. So how do we get that? This. We, uh, we get ourselves a mount that we can lift or goes in the back of our car. Small wish optic, you know, maybe an 8 inch something or a 10 inch or, you know, a nice refractor or that sort of thing. Something you can carry around. A DSLR works great. A cooled camera, as long as it's not one of those, you know, really heavy duty ones where you need a small nuclear pile to cool it to 700 degrees below zero. And you need a laptop. And you need deep cycle batteries or a generator to keep it alive. And this is really where the power problem comes in, keeping your laptop alive. Because I don't know what it is about laptops, but they just love to drink power. And you've got to have a lot of power uh, to keep your laptop alive. And remember what I said, you don't need a lot of horsepower to run, to run an imaging rig. Well, here's the export to PowerPoint. This is what happens. Uh, oh, shoot, really? Okay, well, I have, I have a definition of embedded computing. Let's see if I'm enough of a software engineer to make it up on the fly. An embedded computer is a computer that sort of disappears into the device that it's controlling. So a DSLR is a good example of an embedded computer because it's got a computer inside of it. But it's a DSLR. You don't think of it as a computer. Your car is probably has an embedded computer in it. Most cars have millions of lines of source code running your automobile. But you don't think of your car as a, as a computer connected to wheels and a steering wheel, do you? It's a car. It's got a computer in it that runs the car, but it's a car. Your DVR. Your DVR boots up into an operating system called Linux, and it presents a user interface to the display, which is your TV, and it takes input from a remote. It's a computer. You don't think of your DVR as my computer that serves media, unless you're geeky, okay? Some of us, there's probably a few of you here who are like me who would do that, all right? I built my own DVR with a Raspberry Pi. You can do that, sure, all right? But the unwashed masses, all right, the Walmart crowd, Joe Sixpack, it's just a DVR. And that's really, that's really the right way, that's the evolution of you know, product development, that's the right way to do it. It's, I just need a computer to do this. A broader definition of embedded computing, well, all right, well, da, 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 I said all of that. Low power, okay, that's a hallmark of embedded computing. And okay, so more broadly, embedded computing is one computer that a, a complex task that's run by one computer. And that computer only does that complex task. It doesn't do a lot of other things. So if you take one of these computers 
and you run your imaging rig with it and it's dedicated to just imaging you're not browsing you're not getting on email you're not getting you're not watching netflix or hulu on it uh your kids aren't you know posting on facebook none of us post on facebook we're all adults right uh you know but it's still a computer but it's only doing that and there's a huge advantage to that but how many people are going to buy a laptop just to run their imaging rig and they're not going to do anything else with it well, a few of you. Very good. All right. Very good. Uh, very good. All right. But it's still a computer. It's still serviceable. You can still apply patches. You can still upgrade software to it. But it's a computer that's just going to do it. Now, for a lot of people, buying a laptop just for imaging isn't necessarily as practical. Plus, you can leave your laptop outside in the rain and the dew and the raccoons and all that sort of thing. So we're having this revolution, and this is not astrophotography that's having this revolution. This is the rest of the world. There's whole conferences on embedded uh, computing. And we've got, you know, most of you have heard of the Raspberry Pi. If you haven't, there's a thing called a Raspberry Pi, and it's a computer this big, and it costs $35, and it's 50 bazillion times faster than my first TI-99 4A that I spent many hundreds of dollars on when I was 16 years old. Yes? All right, we got some that are running the displays because, again, you don't need a lot of CPUs to run a display, do you? Yeah. Uh, but there are other options other than the Raspberry Pi. I mean, this is it. Actually, this is the computer. All right? This is connectors. All of this stuff is for connectors to connect to the computer. The computer is practically, you know, your fingernail now. All the, the, that's about as small as we can go if you want to have a bunch of USB ports and an Ethernet and, and plug in a TV and things like that into it because those plugs take up some physical space. Uh, we also have, you know, Odroid, Panda Board, Rock64, the Intel Compute Stick, uh, Tinker Board. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, what, as... Hey, Richard, we need a spreadsheet that lists all of the different options. And I started on it, and I sent an email back and I said, no. <laughs> I said, there's hundreds of them. And so we had some criteria we were looking at. Anyway, I said, no, it, there's hundreds of them. Let's narrow it down a little bit, not all of them, because there are so many of these choices for this, and hobbyists are getting into it. But also, they're really making way in industrial applications. People are automating a lot of different processes and automating a lot of machines. I'm down there. Oh, he's not talking to me. Okay, so if you get one of these little computers, you know, what can you run on it? You can run Windows on them. Uh, the Intel Compute Stick, you could run Windows, and all the software that you're used to on your laptop will run it. Um, you, if you want to ask Tom for your device support, uh, you could also put Linux on it. Uh, Linux has a lot of software. Of course, the SkyX Professional, our, our software is also available on Linux. It's available on Windows, Mac, Linux both ARM and Intel Linuxes, so uh, really great. There are lots of open source stuff, so there's free stuff, KSTAR, Stellarium, uh, Echoes, so there's, there's quite a rich uh, variety. There's actually something for Linux called uh, Indie, which is kind of like ASCOM uh, for, for Linux. And don't get scared by Linux. It's like, oh, I don't, it's Linux is comp, it's another operating system I'm not going to want to do. If you look at a Linux desktop, it looks just like a Windows desktop. And the little fit you drag files around, it's not that, it's not that complicated. But here's the thing, you don't care. It's a computer that does one thing, it runs your imaging software. So what do you need to know how to use? Do you need to know how to use Linux? No, you just need to know how to use your imaging software. How many of you image? How many of you use software to image? How many of you know how to use your software to image? Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay, well, we all have room for improvement. All right, <laughs> yes. But that's, that's really it. Imagine when you turn the computer on, instead of booting up into the operating system, it just boots up into your favorite imaging software. Could be the Sky X, it could be something else. But you just turn it on and it goes, Bloop, okay, what do you want to image today? And you put it to work. And at the end of the night, you close it down. And that's, that's very powerful. So, okay, well, how, we, we're just going to plug a monitor and a mouse then into our, into our mount if we, if we embed that. No, we're going to use remote desktop. So the thing is running on the little box. You don't need a monitor and mouse. You can use your tablet or your phone. You can use regular Windows remote desktop to get to it. There are clients for iOS, uh, Android, and Mac OS as well. Um, there's something called VNC, which stands for Virtual Network Computing. It's basically a free version of Windows 
uh, Remote Desktop, which is actually Windows Remote Desktop, is also free. But it's Windows Remote Desktop for other platforms uh, other than Windows, and they have clients for everything as well. Uh, one thing I like about VNC is it has wrappers so that it'll serve it through a web browser. So you don't even have to install anything on your phone. You can, you can connect to it with your phone using the, you know, the browser on your phone. You just join the Wi-Fi network that the little box makes, and you join it, and it, you know, there's my interface on the phone in a web browser, and you can set up your sequence and tell it to autofocus and get it, uh, get it going. Uh, now, some of us are working on interfaces that are designed for a tablet instead of a desktop interface. So when I first did this, I, I got the Sky, our desktop software, working on a Raspberry Pi, and I went to a desert island in the Gulf of Mexico where there's no power. I'm going to image. This is going to be awesome. I'm going to image on a desert island with no power. It's going to be so powerful. Everybody's going to want to buy our stuff. And it worked. But a desktop program on a tablet is really cool for a little while, but after a bit, it starts getting a little tedious because you can't right click with you know the stylus and then you gotta click this and do that. And oh, I need to click and drag this and you, it's really hard to click and drag with this touch interface. So it works. Desktop software can be made to work if you're motivated, but it's not, it's not, that, it's not that Walmart experience, right? It's not that packaged, easy to use, the back of a DSLR, okay, experience. Imagine if the back of your DSLR was a little bitty desktop up and you had to double click something to start it and you had to click and drag something to get the windows to fit on the back. Nobody would buy a DSLR, right? That would be ridiculous. Uh, so uh, the Sky Professional is working on a tablet friendly interface to all the power of the Sky X Professional. Phenomenal cosmic powers, itty bitty living space, works on a tablet. We're not the only one. There's a, a product called StellarMate. Uh, ZWO also has uh, ASI Air. Uh, both StellarMate and ASI Air are working on uh, Raspberry Pi. LTI is going to work on anything. Uh, it's just it's just uh, it's just a version of the Sky, and we work on everything. So you could you could actually run the tablet on a Windows tablet or an Android tablet or an iOS tablet or or anything you want. But the thing is. We're not the only ones doing it. Everybody's having kind of the same great idea at the same time. So we're not the only game in town, but it's like a, an interface that streamlines the imaging interface, makes it easy to use on a tablet, and it all runs. It doesn't run on the tablet. It's running on this other little computer. So I think I just explained all of that. I just get excited and get ahead of myself. Oh, you could use a laptop too. Why would you use a laptop to connect to the little box? Well, because this full screen interface is pretty nice, and you might like the full screen interface. But the nice thing is, the laptop does not have to be on all night. You can open up the laptop, you get the nice full screen interface. Okay, I want to do this, get everything going, set up Sequence Generator Pro, set up the Sky's you know, automation thing. Okay, focus, take pictures of this, that, click, go. And then you close the laptop, and the laptop goes to sleep and hibernates while you're on a desert island. You don't have a way to recharge your laptop. And the little box running on a little lithium ion battery is chugging away and imaging. And you hear something outside. So you roll over in your tent and you pull your phone out and you pull up the web interface on the phone and go, oh, it just changed targets. It's guiding. It's, oh, it's focusing. Okay. You go back to sleep. And in the morning you have a, you have a box full of, uh, you have a box full of data. So yeah, you can use it with the tablet uh, or phone. So it's, it's kind of nice because you can switch back and forth. And you don't have to leave your laptop outside uh, all night. Uh, I live in Florida, which I may have mentioned. Um, it will just spontaneously rain in Florida for no good reason other than the fact that you have $50,000 sitting outside in the backyard uncovered. It'll go, hey, we should rain over there. Uh, and, and it'll just form right over your house. And I'm not kidding. It will form over your house and nowhere else in the neighborhood. Uh, I also have uh, raccoons that will raid my neighbor's garbage and then bring it into my backyard and spread chicken bones and eggshells all over the place. And I don't want to leave a $3,000 Mac laptop out in the backyard uncovered for the raccoons to whatever raccoons do in the dark, uh, you know, outside on my, on my stuff. So very good. Uh, I want to talk a little bit. Just yes. I'm good. Yes, it would run with a Chromebook. Yes. In fact, I use Chrome for my preferred browser uh, when I use the browser interface. I use Chrome. I use, it on, I use Chrome on my Mac, and I use Chrome on uh, my Android tablet and on, uh, well, I can't use it on iOS, but actually there may be a way to do that. But, and the Chromebook is just, it's, it's basically, um, 
yes, it'll run it'll run on a Chromebook fine. Yep, yep. That's actually a really good. Next time I'm showing it off somewhere, I should bring a Chromebook and show it just to show that, just to demonstrate. It will run on anything. Any modern any modern web browser can connect to it, or any any modern operating system has a client to connect to that to that device and serve you what's going on on that device. How many of you have been in computers for like, you know, more than 40, 30 or 40 years? It's just client server all over again, right? You, we've all seen, it's, it's a big circle. It just, we, history repeats itself. That's all this is, is history repeating itself. I, I wish I could say we came up with something really brilliant, but all it is is you figure out a good, you take a good idea from 30 years ago and you bring it back and you make it better uh, using modern stuff. Um, <laughs> there's a market for just about anything isn't there all right uh just so i've talked about the computers i've talked about the software and the technology and it's great and all i want to say a few words about how you're going to power this um this is a power box i built myself my favorite way to, to power this is with a lithium ion phosphate the big, big, big giant, uh, big bang word, right? Lithium ion phosphate. These batteries are really great. Very low, uh, very light, high density energy. Uh, they're unaffected by cold, which is really great. Uh, better, uh, safer than regular lithium ion, uh, and then much, much lighter than lead acid. Uh, but they are a little bit pricey, but they're really, uh, I think this is like the Cadillac, uh, Cadillac power supply for, for portable imaging. Uh, this little battery is what I took to the, dry tortugas on my desert island trip and um, you can cool I can cool my can I can cool my starlight express camera and run everything for two nights on that little on that little battery another advantage of these is as the battery goes down the voltage doesn't drop so it holds the voltage until it's about dead it's got circuitry in it so you can't destroy the battery when it goes dead so if you want the best of the best of the best the the lithium ion phosphate uh, battery technologies are the best of course they cost more than the best too that one was 25 yeah 25 and that was uh, less than $300 but like I used to tell my kids don't ever say only in front of more than one dollar <laughs> <laughs> so $300 was, is a good chunk of change and even I it's for work honey you know it's, 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 it's work um, these little uh, ego batteries so there's a whole line of electrical um, uh, lawn equipment, electric wire, uh, electric weed eaters, electric lawnmowers, all those sorts of things. And you can buy these at Home Depot. And people are making it, we make an adapter for this to run our mount, but other people are making adapters uh, to convert this to 12 volts to run their energy system because they charge really fast. So like my, my deep cycle battery takes all day to pretty much to, to get fully charged again. This thing will charge up from almost dead to completely charged in like 15 minutes. It's got a little blower on it. It's like a turbo turbo thing. So this is, a, this is not a bad compromise over the uh, lithium ion phosphate. And they even make some uh, inverter packages that they'll plug into it. Again, you know, you can go from 80 to $800. Uh, another really popular one is uh, the Goal Zero from Yeti. Uh, they make a variety. They have lead acid and lithium ion versions of that. They have versions, you can actually power your house on those things. Um, and a lot of people, and you can buy solar panels for them if you're really crazy and you want to lug around a whole lot of stuff uh, and charge it, uh, charge it up in the daytime. So lead acid I left the last, not because it's the worst, because we just talked about some really cool new things and the, the advantages over lead acid are, are obvious. But I, I do want to sort of remind you of some advantages to using a lead acid battery. You know, it's kind of old school, all right? Uh, but you don't need a special charger. So if you leave the charger at home, uh, any Walmart or pilot station is going to have a battery charger that you can pop on that thing and get going again. Very economical. Uh, and you can't ship batteries. Uh, you can't take them on an airplane. Those, lift, those batteries I was showing you, can't take them on an airplane. You can't ship them. Uh, sometimes you can sneak it past them. But you sneak it past and get it there, you may not be able to sneak them past them and get it back. And they're not, if they're not allowed to do it, it's le not legal, theoretically. I'm not an expert, but it may be dangerous. 
uh, you know, you don't want to blow up a plane or anything like that. So they don't ship batteries. So you know what I did when I, I first discovered this the hard way, uh, trip to Hawaii, I'm going to image on Haleakala. Ooh, awesome. I'm gonna f and I'm going to bring my little super lightweight battery system. And the UPS lady said, no, you're not. No, not going to happen. So I went home and I pouted. And then I realized <sighs> they have Walmart in Maui. They have batteries. Uh, it's cheaper, not only that, but what I would used to pay to ship my lithium ion batteries, for half of the cost of shipping them one way, I could buy a deep cycle battery at Walmart and then give it away before I come home. And say, like, well, you're giving it away. It's, it's like less than $100 per trip. $100 is $100. But if you want to go, if you want to fly to Hawaii and, and image at the top of Haleakala, and you can, it's a national park, it's open 24 hours. You need a battery system, go to the Walmart, buy one of this, and then give it to the nice little girl at the UPS store who is delighted to get a free battery. But that's it. I did the same thing at the Grand Canyon Star Party. I flew into Phoenix, bought a, bought a battery at Walmart, and then I gave it away to somebody at the Star Party who made me sandwiches. And it was, it cost, like I said, it costs less than shipping it. So it's, it's not a loss, really. It's actually, I'm saving money by giving away batteries. So they have their, they have their appeal. They, they, they have their appeal. If you have a paramount, what does it look like in practice? Let me show you, because all my pictures have paramounts, obviously. No, you can't use uh, Ego battery. No. Um, oh, no, no, but you can bring an inverter. You can bring an inverter. So for Haleakala, that battery ran my cooled camera and an inverter, which ran the power pack for the Paramount. So you, that's also an option. You, do, it does, you can run an inverter if you need something different than 12 volts. Um, here's a Raspberry Pi and a Robo Focus controller. The computer is actually smaller than the Focus controller. Uh, the Raspberry Pi actually has some GPIO bins. I saw somebody recently actually is making a Raspberry Pi focus controller because you can control a stepper motor with the Raspberry Pi directly. So it's like, why didn't somebody do that? We should do that. We should do that. Richard, shut up. We can only have so many ideas. Somebody else did it, and that's fine. They can sell it. They're not going to make a lot of money off of it, but it's, it's a great idea, and I'm glad somebody, somebody is doing it. Uh, here's, you know, the whole, the whole imaging system. Uh, we have through the mount cabling for the power. If you don't have a paramount, all you need, though, is still one, one power cable going up to there. Here's your computer. Everything plugs into the computer. There's no dangling wires. Dangling wires are the devil, all right, when it comes to imaging. Dangling wires are the devil. There's no dangling wires. Your computer is up on top, riding up there. All the cables nice and neat. I even, put a, I even got a little lithium ion phosphate battery that goes up here that runs my dew heater so I don't have to run an extra power uh, up through the mount. Here's another picture. Here's the Ego battery running my Paramount. And uh, there's another battery, and so I've got a little little uh, little Starlight Express camera on there. I like the Starlight Express. It's just the, the, for a cooled camera, they don't draw much current. So little more than an amp to get it cool, and then once it's cool, it draws much less than that. So uh, the Trius, I have 694 and 814. I get color and mono. I got lots of cameras because I write software for them. Um, but my, that one is the Mono 694. That's probably my favorite one of them. But you can cool that camera all night, and it draws very little, very little power. Um, so it's, it's great. And then the computer, a Raspberry Pi is 5 volts, and if it's not doing a lot, it only draws half an amp or even less when it's idle and waiting for a picture to download. So you can get away with murder when it comes to powering uh, these little remote systems. Uh, another one of my early tests, this was the Nebraska Star Party. Again, flew out there. This was at, on this trip, I actually got away with shipping the ion lithium batteries. They didn't know that I, what I had done. This is my, uh, my desert island trip to the Tortugas. Wrote that up in Sky and Telescope in February a couple of years back. But here's the whole imaging system. This is my Ego battery that's a boat. So you take a ferry out there, and every camper can only have 60 pounds. And it was my birthday, and I said, hey, for my birthday, I want to go camping. So the whole family went camping. And I looked up. Everybody gets 60 pounds. I said, hey, we're going camping, and I'm paying for it. Everybody can bring 30 pounds. <laughs> 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 yeah. <clears throat> so 
Yeah, that were, in fact, that counterweight, actually, I put that counterweight in my backpack, and that was clever, but let me tell you, it's surprising how heavy that backpack gets <laughs> after an hour or so. Um, but nice boat ride out there, Pelican case, a few things. I've got two little batteries, little 80 millimeter refractor. I even brought a guider, um, you know, just to show I could. And this is my iPad with a blue ta Bluetooth keyboard. And I, the, the, I, here's the computer. Up, yeah, that's the computer right there, just right in there. And then I'd connect to it, do whatever I need to do, and then sh shut it down. And we'd have some more white Russians and then I'd open it up and go oh, my images are great so it was uh, it was a good uh, it was a good test and it works it works really well here's my Haleakala trip that I was talking about just again little computer run the mount you don't have to have a laptop running the whole thing uh, the most recent Grand Canyon there's my little deep cycle battery uh, that I brought along for that and here's my my tablet computer running the interface I do have a Samsung tablet just I use that every now and then just to make myself so I can say yeah it works on Android and I'm not saying it works on Android because I know it will because I'm smart and I know it will I, it, I've used it and, and I find that a lot of times if I'm really sure I should try it because as they say one test is worth a thousand expert opinions okay well I did bring an imaging system with me uh, I did not get it set up today and there's a hurricane coming and my wife insists that I come home tomorrow so maybe next year I will have some pictures at almost heaven on the field uh, with my little uh, portable image rig this is not just for mobile imagers though this technology wave uh, what about using it in your backyard do you want to leave your laptop in the backyard all night uh, join your home Wi-Fi and control it from your bedroom uh, that's fun uh, watching TV with my wife and she's like what are you doing over there I go look she, oh that's pretty because I can't get her to go outside she'll see you know, bugs it's Florida is not very friendly outside in the dark uh, but uh, it's really great maybe you've got your own observatory all right uh, not my it's not necessarily set up in my backyard I've got my own observatory well that's nice um, big tech support issue all right my, my peers over there my warm rooms right here my computers here and you can't run USB that far so I get this USB cable that's got a powered extender and it my friend said it worked and I bought it but I bought a different camera than he did and it doesn't work and then so then I buy the $300 Icron super monster one that's government certified and yeah that works with $10,000 cameras but it does not work with $800 Chinese cameras and so what are you gonna do well stop it just put a little computer at the mount and run Ethernet and connect and run remote desktop from your desktop computer. Well, I want to do pics and site and stuff on the same one. That's fine. You set up a network share and you copy it all to your computer and you pics and site it to death uh, to your um, to your heart's content. So Ethernet cable, I find Wi-Fi works great when you're in the field, in the backyard. Wi-Fi works great at my own dark sky observatory. I've buried Ethernet out to the pier. I've got a little room that's mosquito proof and air conditioned. And even with a Raspberry Pi, you plug that into your laptop and it's like it's like it's like you're connect you're there it's super fast there's not real there's no latency or anything to it things have gotten a lot better than they were 10 or 15 years ago when we used 300 baud dial-up modems you know to try to, to log on to AOL you know <laughs> that that was uh, plus the little computers for remote um, some friends and I are setting up a remote observatory in uh, California and we're gonna put one of these computers on it because there's no moving parts there's no hard drive uh, I've left the pie down at my observatory in Okeechobee which is hell on earth all right I literally image from the swamp I go down there I have to clean out the frogs and the snakes and and the armadillos and all sorts of things and the ants the carpenter ants will get in there and build nets and if you got anything that moves fans they'll get in there if there's an opening they want to crawl in there and make babies and they want to put gooey stuff everywhere and it's not good for your, it's not good for computers or well or telescopes either but these little boxes are very robust the fans don't ever go bad on them they don't overheat um, and you put a solid state hard drive on there uh, for storage and and they last uh, they last quite a bit and they're uh, quite a while and they're very uh, they're very robust it is the future I, it's not the really the future it's actually here and so we're seeing that we're seeing this happen already software best yay! but other people also doing the same thing yay! because you know why because it's a good idea 
it is, it's just a good idea. And if it's a good idea, everybody's going to be doing it. And you should too. All right. Questions? Mm -hmm. Do they sell those like that already? Like with, say, four USB ports? Yes. They, they sell them. Well, do they have to build it? it uh, you can buy them. Like, like here it is in a box. So it's, it's literally, I, am a cl I don't build stuff very well. I'm a software engineer. I tried doing electronics for a while, and they fired me. They didn't fire me, but it's just I let the smoke out of things way too often. Software is really great. You can save your state and restore it and not blow things up. So I am not mechanically inclined. But I can take a circuit board and pop it into a piece of plastic and then pop the other piece of plastic on top of it. So that's all that's required for building it. Is it's literally a clamshell, and the computer goes inside. So the bottom shell, put the computer in. You put the top shell. It snaps on, and you're done. You've built a computer. That's all there is to it. Yeah. Let's break one. Where is it? He's the extra one. I'll let you find it. I forgot. I actually brought some with me. Yeah. No, uh, you know, Best Buy sells them. I got, I bought all mine off Amazon. Here we go. I love it. All right, he nailed it to a board. <laughs> that works too, literally. <laughs> literally, he nailed it to a board. That's that's the Raspberry Pi. Yep. And so the little the little board runs about thirty five dollars. And it has a quad core processor running at the gigahertz. It's got two giga. You can get them now with four gigabytes of RAM, um, four, uh, four USB slots. The newer ones have two USB 3 slots and two USB 2 slots. Uh, it runs Raspbian, which is a version of Linux, yes. Is that? Oh, that, that's not. Oh, yeah, the micro SD card. You can spend as much or as little as you want. Uh, buy the fast ones. It does make it perkier. Uh, so you just, you can literally go to the, let me, that's it. You go to the photography thing, your camera takes them, and you just stick them in here. You have to image it. So, I mean, you have to, you have to copy the operating system on it. But if you buy a kit, you can buy a kit. comes with a power supply. comes with a pre-made card, everything ready to go. You can buy a kit from Stellarium. Not only do you get the whole pie in the box, but it already has all the astronomy software on it. You can buy a kit from ZWO. Not only do you get a box with the Raspberry Pi already in it, it already has all the astronomy software on it. You can buy a kit from Attic. Attic has one now too. Gives you, they ship you a box, and it's got the operating system and everything on it. As far as the software goes, um, oh, we're going to get into a commercial. <laughs> a lot of it's freeware and open source, so you get what you pay for. Skyx Professional also runs on it. So if you want a professional package by people who spend all day doing making software to image with and image with it themselves, we have that. And it'll run on any of them. Uh, a friend of mine uh, came down to visit my observatory, and he had... Uh, the ZWO one, and he was frustrated with it, and I just, I just imaged, just, I reformatted his card and put my software on it, and he was happy. <laughs> but our software costs a lot more than, than they do, though. So it's, it's kind of like comparing a, you know, a very inexpensive with very much. But a lot of people do, uh, I do like those packages. Uh, you can make them work. I'm just biased. I mean, you're asking me if my baby is as pretty as their baby. No, my baby is prettiest. Um, but those other packages, they, they do work. A lot of people are very happy with them. I'm used to imaging my way, and so I can't use them. And nine to, is that because mine's better? Well, yeah, but it's also because I'm used to mine. Let's be honest. The easiest software to use is the one you know how to use. Uh, is he in here? Who's giving the talk in the morning? I'll put you on the spot. Somebody's giving a talk in the morning on a similar topic about. I'm sorry. Does is he got to get home to the hurricane too? Ah, uh, see, I. 
are you sure that wasn't me? Because that's exactly what happened. That's why I'm going home in the morning. But I told my wife I couldn't come home until I went to his talk. So he, oh, man. All right. Well, never mind. Then you only have me to go by. And so we make, we, the, you know, the Skype's professional. It, it's, um, it's a sophisticated package. It's expensive, uh, but it is world class. It's used by real astronomers and observatories and all that sort of thing. Thank you for letting me, you know, tout my products. Uh, but the ZWO uh, product, uh, it, it works with ZWO software. Um, it's much, much less money. You know, we're talking just a couple hundred dollars for a whole system. Um, well, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. People say that about our software too and now, every now and then, but yes. So there's, okay, so good question. What about just, uh, are we going to just stick this in the camera? Uh, there are a couple of companies doing that already. QHY actually has a couple of cameras that have ARM-based computers embedded in them. Um, there's a company, I can't remember the name, there's a company in, in Europe that's also already doing that, embedding, and it runs the sky. You can run the sky on the QHY camera, you can run the sky on this other guy's camera. The question is, where do you want, it's a tiny computer. Does it go in the mount? Does it go in the camera? Does it go in the focuser? Should I put it in my temperature probe that's running my dew heater? You need a computer, but you really just need one computer dedicated only to running the whole, the whole show. It could go in the in the in the camera. I prefer to keep it separate. I like having a little box that you wire in because then you can upgrade that box very simply. Uh, you can update the software on that box uh, very simply. You can get a you know a new box later. You know adds adds other device support to it. Uh, so, you know, the sky works with, you know, dozens and dozens of cameras, dozens and dozens of mounts and all that sort of thing. And uh, Attic, obviously Attic only works with their cameras and ZWO only works with their cameras. But StellarMate has a very, um, a very competitive uh, device support set. They support dozens of mounts, um, dozens of cameras. They're using the ND standard, which is like the ASCOM uh, for Linux. Yeah, and, and a lot of people want to shoot with more than just one camera. So, well, the, well, well, the c computer can inside your camera will it control another camera as well. So it's better to have the box that's kind of tying everything together, I, I, I think. What is yours? We don't have a box that we sell. We don't have a kit. We don't have a kit. So we were the first... To ha we we were the we were before that we were shipping the sky on the for the Raspberry Pi before the other guys started shipping Raspberry Pis, and a lot of people said, "Hey Richard, just sell the Pi with the sky installed on it." And how many of you work for a living? How many of you have bosses? How many of you have bosses who have other ideas and other things you should be working on? That's great. How much are we going to make on a little box? You know, if we're going to charge for it. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not being disrespectful, Steve, if you watch this later online, it's just, you know, in a, in a, in a company like ours, we have to balance, you know, we have to balance priorities and we have four main developers and about 800 different gigantic projects that we're going to die if aren't done by the end of the month. And so, uh, making a little box with a Raspberry Pi on it just hasn't, has just hasn't bubbled to the top yet, but We've been shipping the sky on the Raspberry Pi for a couple of years. So we have a lot of end users who just get on Amazon, spend a hundred bucks for a whole Raspberry Pi kit, and then they just install the sky on it. Um, and, and, they, and they do that. I mean, it's not hard to build it yourself. It is kind of clever to just ship a box ready to go, and maybe we'll do that one day. But if, right now, we're, try, you know, we're, try, we're too busy getting a lot of other things that needed to be done a year ago that still aren't done we got to get them finished first so it's all about priorities not that the house is burning down but you know when the house is burning down it's not the time to get out the vacuum cleaner so it's it's kind of like that yeah are, are you running the proliferation of different device types are you running into a situation that the industry needs standardization otherwise it's all fall so different device types so this is Thank you for another opportunity to insert a commercial from my employer. This is where uh, software BISC really shines. So we support ASCOM, and Windows is an ASCOM-specific uh, te technology. But we also have our own standard called X2. 
And for many years, the, the grief was, well, you're, you're using a proprietary standard instead of using ASCOM. And we were like, well, we've got a lot of our users that want to run on a Macintosh, and we can't make ASCOM work on a Macintosh. And so, and we've been doing device control since before ASCOM existed. So, and nobody working on ASCOM asked out for our input, hey, we're going to build a standard since you guys have been doing it for a really long time. Do you have anything you'd like to to add to this, you know, brain pool. So we've do, been doing our own thing and we support ASCOM fully. The sky were as an, as an ASCOM server, we support any ASCOM device, camera, focuser, mount, all of that. So we're totally on board with that, but we, we had our own. We liked our own cause it's our baby. And the advantage was we were able to, to provide the sky X professional to Macintosh users. But that was, that was sort of a, um, a loss, it was like, okay, well, how many Mac people are there? Enough, enough. But here's what's happened. We, we, knew, we knew what was going to happen many, many years ago. And the Macintosh is actually Unix, which is what Linux is divide, derived from. And so our X2 standard works on Linux as well. And so guess what? We have, all, we have native device support on Linux for hundreds of mounts, dozens of cameras, focusers, uh, all of that, all of that stuff. It's not as complete as it is on Windows or is it on the Mac? Because a lot of uh, a lot of vendors also do their own native plugins for the Sky. Um, over, and there's some some tricky advanced cameras that ASCOM just doesn't work very well for that the native uh, interface works for. And so we work with those vendors to get native support. So with that commercial out of the way, there is an ASCOM-like standard for Linux called Indy. And it's if your software can talk to an indie device, then it can talk to any camera that has an indie driver for it. And there's a large community of open source people, uh, some professionals, some kids in their mom's basement, whatever, uh, that are making indie plugins for different devices. So the indie standard is it's as Linux is taking as this is taking off to where I don't want my computer to update itself in the middle of my imaging run one more time. Uh, in the middle of the night and and I, and the computer I used for imaging my wife was looking up a recipe and then she got a Trojan and so in the middle of the night it turned into a porn server so I just had just need a tiny little I just want a computer that's just going to run my imaging system and Linux is very you know Amazon is run on Linux uh, before I was in this industry I did uh, healthcare software and embedded surgical things if there's a device in the hospital keeping your grandfather alive it's not running Windows all right, it's it's yeah, it's it's running Linux. So Linux is very powerful, and you, the end user, you don't have to learn Linux. You shouldn't care. Do you care? Is your DS, is your DVR difficult and complicated because it's running Linux? No, you don't care. This is where we're going. We're gonna get to the point where you know I've been calling it Skybox for years. It's the sky in a box. You turn it on and it boots into the sky, and when you shut it down, it turns the computer off. There's no desktop. There's there's none of that. And you can connect to it over the network and drag your files over uh, or plug in a USB drive and, and copy your files to the USB drive if you don't want to leave them on the, uh, on the device. So this is where we're going. We're, we're leading the way, but if we don't lead the way, it's going to run over us because it's coming. Whether, we, whether we're leading the way or somebody else is leading the way, it's coming. Another question. Yes. Mm -hmm. establish the guiding. Does Raspberry Pi still make sense for me? Well, do you use a computer? Yeah. Then yeah. Because it's doing the guiding. It's doing right. It does everything. It'll do everything your the computer you're using does now. Only it will cost less, be more reliable, and you don't have to worry about raccoons pooping so on it. Oh, 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 no, it won't run SGP. So um, if you want to run Windows stuff, I would recommend like an Intel stick computer, which literally looks like a jump drive. So earlier today, somebody gave me the clicker and I thought it was a jump drive. There's actually a computer that looks like a jump drive, uh, Intel stick computer. And a lot of people are doing this with the Intel. There was a picture of it on one of the previous slides. Yeah, you plug the stick computer into a USB hub. So you get a little little hub and you plug the stick computer into the hub and then you plug all your stu other stuff into the hub and the stick computer sees it and you're and you're good to go and it makes a little wi-fi hotspot and everything it's awesome 
I can talk to my mom with a watch now, you know, a video chat with my mom on a watch. We live in the future. It's awesome. It's about time astrophotography caught up, don't you think? Yeah, it is. It's going to catch up. Any other questions about this stuff? Yes. Oh, I will stick around if anybody wants to. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.